straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily, the trial for the men accused of murdering Ahmad Arbery. Now, did you ask Mr. Gregory Michael how many shots there were? I did. What did he say? He said there were two shots. What defendant Gregory McMichael told police just after Arbery's death and fallout from the deadly Astroworld concert. Festival performer Drake speaks for the first time since the deadly crowd surge. Plus, hundreds of documents released in the case of accused wife killer Barry Morphew, who the prosecution intends to call as witnesses in the coming trial. And later, expert testimony in the deadly Kenosha shootings. This is the single gunshot wound and it uh, created lethal injury involving the heart and lungs. Hear from the prosecution's final witness before it rests its case. Law and Crime Daily, covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I am Imran Ansari, in for Brian Buckmeyer, who is in Georgia covering the death of Ahmad Arbery trial. Here in New York, I'm alongside co-host Terry Austin. Three men face life in prison if convicted in the death of 25-year-old Ahmad Arbery. In February of 2020, Arbery, an unarmed black man, was gunned down while running near his Brunswick, Georgia home. He died as a result of his injuries. Defendants Gregory and Travis McMichael and William Roddy Bryan face several charges in connection to his death, including malice murder, felony murder, and aggravated assault. Father and son Gregory and Travis McMichael tailed Arbery in their pickup truck as he ran. Travis McMichael eventually shot Arbery, and he's now claiming self-defense. Bryan followed along in his own pickup truck and recorded the incident in a now-famous viral video. After weeks of jury selection, opening statements began on Friday at the Glynn County Courthouse in Georgia. And that is where our very own Brian Buckmeyer is now live outside that Georgia courthouse. Brian, police investigators took the stand on Tuesday. What were the big takeaways from their testimony? Yes, Imran, the focus on day three of the trial were the statements by the McMichaels the day of Ahmaud Arbery's death and the lack of injuries on Travis McMichael. For Travis McMichael, an officer testified Travis didn't ask for medical attention and questioned whether the mark on the back of his head was an injury. And for Gregory McMichael, the prosecution painted the picture through his statements that he was operating on assumptions, not seeing Aubrey in the home the day of his death, chasing him uh, merely because he was running from down the street and screaming at him to stop or or he'd blow his head off. Defense pushed back, trying to show that the cries for Aubrey to stop happened at the end of the chase and not in the middle, something that went back and forth during redirect and direct. But what was really shocking was what Gregory McMichael said he would have done if he could. On the stand, a responding officer testified Gregory McMichael called Aubrey profanities in a police interview as he stood just 20 feet from Aubrey's body. What did he say then? I saw him, yeah, in fact, if, if, to be perfectly honest with you, if I could have got a shot at the guy, I'd have shot him myself. And then, does the male speaker inquire about his son? Is he your does. son okay? Yes, ma'am. What's Greg Michael say? He's upset as hell. Does he repeat that? Yes, ma'am. And then the male speaker says, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. The male speaker then asks him a question. What does the male speaker ask him at line 25? So the guy, the guy have a gun. And what does Greg McMichael say on the top of page 28? No, I don't know. I mean, I couldn't tell if it's one on him or not, but he was, he attacked my son. Since Sheffield objected to the authentication of surveillance at the construction site, but the judge overruled him. You think the judge made the right call with that decision? Actually not. The judge has been great uh, so far, but when it comes to authenticating a video, typically you need either an individual in the video or someone who's the custodian of the video equipment to say that what is being showed in the video is a true and accurate representation of what it purports to be. An officer who merely downloads that video can't really testify to that. They can testify ch to chain of custody, but not that what's being played in the video is real and not slowed down or sped up, as I think Jason Sheffield correctly argued. Right, and it also sounds like things got heated in that courtroom today, Brian, to the point that the judge excused himself, excused the jury, stepped off the bench himself, and had some choice words for Travis Michael's defense team. What happened in the courtroom, Mike? 
So I think it actually built up for that one aspect of the video coming in that Jason Sheffield, when cross-examining a witness, was trying to almost backdoor a way into getting a definition of burglary that would have helped his case. The prosecution, I think rightly in this time, objected to that and the judge sustained it, meaning it wasn't coming in. But Jason Sheffield gave at least a physical expression towards the judge, not in any kind of aggressive way, but you can just see he disregarded or had a certain disdain, sorry, for that objection and being sustained to the point that the judge excused the jury and told him in a way that almost was like your mother is saying, uh, I'm disappointed in you, told Jason Sheffield that he was rude and said that he, the judge, was actually going to step off the bench so that Jason Sheffield can think about what he's doing. Brian, thank you for your great reporting down there in Georgia, and we will be keeping tabs on what is going on through your great reporting. And still ahead here on Law & Crime Daily, we go inside the Kenosha courtroom, where accused murderer Kyle Rittenhouse is on trial. But first, eight deaths and many injuries after the Astro World Music Festival in Houston. Our very own Anjanette Levy is live with the latest comments from the headliners of that event. It was the video that shocked the nation. An unarmed black jogger, 25-year-old Ahmad Aubrey, gunned down in broad daylight. The three men charged will now stand trial. For live gavel gavel coverage of the trial, subscribe to Law & Crime on YouTube TV today. Welcome back. And the family of a nine-year-old boy who's fighting for his life after the Astro World concert tragedy files a lawsuit. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is here with what the suit claims and more about the child. Anjanette? Yeah, Imran, his name is Ezra Blount, and he was actually at Astroworld with his father when he was injured, and right now he is on life support at a Texas hospital. Ezra Blount's family has set up a GoFundMe account to raise money for his medical expenses. A lawsuit filed by attorneys for Ezra's family claims negligence in a number of areas, including crowd control, failure to provide medical attention, training, and more. Travis Scott, Live Nation, and several others are named in the suit. In a statement, attorney Ben Crump wrote, This young child and his family will face life-altering trauma from this day forward, a reality that nobody expects when they buy concert tickets. This little boy is currently fighting for his life, and his parents will never know the same child they entered Astro World with. For the first time, we are hearing from rapper Drake. He posted on Instagram, I've spent the past few days trying to wrap my head around this devastating tragedy. I hate resorting to this platform to express an emotion as delicate as grief, but this is where I find myself. My heart is broken for the families and friends of those who lost their lives and for anyone who is suffering. Eight people were killed Friday night as the crowd pushed toward the stage during Travis Scott's performance. A memorial has taken shape outside of NRG Park, where a criminal investigation is underway. And Houston's fire chief actually told the Today Show that Travis Scott and others should have stopped the concert when they realized what was happening. The music still played on uh, for a time. Uh, while this whole event was unfolding. Imran? Yeah, it's a real tragedy. And let's bring back my co-host, Terry Austin. And also joining with us now is criminal defense attorney Adam Conta. Adam, thanks for being here. I'm going to start with you. We have now heard from rapper Drake on social media expressing his condolences. Do you think that Drake or any of the, uh, any of the other performers at the concert could face some liability here? Well, it depends what you mean. I, I don't see any criminal liability yet. Uh, although this is obviously an unspeakable tragedy, I think there are certainly going to be some civil remedies and some civil avenues that they all explore. And we're starting to see what I'm sure will be an avalanche of lawsuits. But as of yet, I don't see any criminal liability. And Terry, do you think that this incident could result in some legislation uh, to protect concert goers at concerts going forward? It actually could, Enron. I mean, right now, we know that under, you know, common tort law, you can sue for negligence, and we are seeing that already. Multiple suits have been made against the organizers, against the performers. But we know for a fact that there are some statutes in Texas which protect concert goers 
And the property owner right now has a duty under the law in Texas to protect the patrons and make sure they hire security that is licensed to protect those patrons. But I do anticipate that at some point in time, we could see additional legislation, additional standards to make sure that something like this never happens again. Right. And Antoinette, we know that there are civil lawsuits have, that have been filed already. Um, what is the status of the criminal investigation? Well, Imran, we know that the Houston Police Department has opened this criminal investigation, but now the FBI is also a part of it. And so uh, Live Nation, they were the promoter putting on this show. They actually stopped removing equipment and other items from NRG Park so that the investigators could still walk through, get a proper lay of the land as all of this was unfolding. So uh, this is very much an active criminal investigation. Whether or not anyone will ultimately face criminal charges, we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, it's a real tragedy, and we'll be watching as the legal developments unfold. And coming up here on Law & Crime Daily, state prosecutors rest their case in the murder trial of accused Kenosha shooter Kyle Rittenhouse. Plus, hundreds of pages of inside information now released in the case of accused white killer Barry Morphew. What court documents reveal about Morphew's arrest and investigation. Welcome back to Law and Crime Daily, and nearly 500 pages of court documents and investigative notes have been released in the case of accused murderer Barry Morphew. On Monday, a Colorado judge released the previously private documents detailing several key takeaways. The 454 pages of motions, filings, and court orders show Morphew refused to take a polygraph exam following his arrest. The documents also include a list of more than 500 potential witnesses for the prosecution, including Morphew's two adult daughters, co-workers, FBI agents, and Colorado investigators. All this comes as the defense claims the prosecution withheld some key evidence from the case, including a forensic image of Morphew's cell phone and recordings from a spy pen. Morphew is accused of killing his wife, Suzanne Morphew, who went missing on Mother's Day in 2020. Though a body has never been found, Morphew faces a first-degree murder charge. Right now, a trial is scheduled for May of 2022. Let's bring in uh, our great guest, Adam Conta, and my co-host, Terry Austin. Adam, um, Adam I'm going to start with you. We are learning that Barry Morphew declined to take a lie detector test. Could that work against him in any way? Uh, you know, only if he has a bad defense attorney. Lie detector tests are, it's a misnomer to even call it a lie detector test. What they are really are sort of body response tests. And there is no basis in, in the scientific community that they work. There's nothing in the scientific community that says this is an accurate method of testing someone's veracity. Uh, and, and it should never be used. It should never, ever, ever, ever be used. I would never allow a, a client of mine to use one. And he did the right thing. This is totally apart from if he did or did not commit uh, the, the heinous act of murder against his wife. A lie detector test is bogus science that only exists in the popular cultural world because of movies and television. It, it's one of those things that you should be able to dismiss as a defense attorney very easily. And so I, I hope that it would not be used against him. And, and in fact, that he would, that it's more that the science of, uh, the, the pseudoscience of, of lie detector tests would be put on, uh, put on trial in that moment versus his decision. Right. And Terry, the defense is claiming that the prosecution has not revealed all of the evidence. Does the prosecution have an obligation to disclose to the defense their evidence? Yeah, absolutely. There's no question about it. They have a continuing obligation to disclose evidence, particularly if it's exculpatory evidence, meaning evidence that would show the innocence of the defendant. So that has to be revealed or else they face a possible Brady violation. So they also have to just make sure they give all of their witnesses and that they give all of their expert witnesses and the reports as far as that's concerned. So I think at this point, we're seeing all these pages talking about what the evidence might be. And it makes sense for that to be disclosed at this point prior to when we know trial is going to be imminent in the next few months. 
Terry and Adam, great analysis. And now on to news from our chief investigative correspondent, Brian Ross, who this week investigates the case of environmental lawyer Stephen Donziger, who sued uh, oil company Chevron on behalf of thousands of indigenous people in Ecuador. Brian Ross is here to tell us more about this week's episode. Brian? Thanks. Coming up this week on Brian Ross Investigates, the latest on the American lawyer Steve Donziger, who went to the Amazon to help the people there fight against a giant American oil company and now finds himself behind bars in the United States. His spirits are good. Uh, you know, Steve is remarkably resilient. He wouldn't have been able to fight, you know, Chevron and, and its corporatist tools for as long as he had uh, without being resilient. Uh, jail is obviously a, a new experience for him, but he's not in camp fed here. Uh, he's in a low security institution, which you know mostly means that the other prisoners are are all there for nonviolent offenses. But some of them are serving uh, very long sentences. Uh, he's in dormitory style housing. There's 59 people crammed together in one room. People doing their laundry and hanging laundry on the pipes. And and Stephen said it actually looked like some of the refugee camps that he visited and now he's a, a, a part of. That's coming up this week on Brian Ross Investigates on the Long Crime Trial Network. Back to you. Thank you, Brian. And you can watch Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network Tuesdays and Thursdays at 5.30 and 10.30 Eastern Time. And when we come back, the state rests its case in what the judge calls the most divisive case in the country. We take you inside the Kenosha courtroom where the medical examiner testifies in the state of Wisconsin versus Kyle Rittenhouse. Welcome back to Law and Crime Daily. The prosecution rests its case in trial of accused Kenosha shooter Kyle Rittenhouse. 18-year-old Rittenhouse faces multiple charges, including first-degree murder, reckless murder, and attempted murder following the August 2020 shootings in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Prosecutors say Rittenhouse shot and killed Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber and injured Gage Grosskreutz. Rittenhouse's team argues the defendant was acting in self-defense. On Tuesday, the state called its final witness, medical examiner Dr. Doug Kelly, who performed the autopsy on both Huber and Rosenbaum. He testified that Huber's autopsy was performed first, the morning after the shooting. Were you able to determine the cause of death to Mr. Huber? Yes. And what was that cause of death? Uh, Mr. Huber died from a gunshot wound to the chest. It uh, basically travels through his chest and creates trauma to both of the lungs and, and specifically to the heart. There's a lot of, of damage to the heart. Dr. Kelly testified he performed the autopsy on Joseph Rosenbaum the following day. He detailed Rosenbaum's cause of death while on the stand. We've talked about how the other injuries were not ones that would immediately cause a mortal wound. Uh, what impact do you believe that this gunshot would have had on Mr. Rosenbaum? Uh, this gunshot wound is a lethal injury. This uh, gunshot wound is the uh, uh, one that would cause um, death as a result of the injuries to the lungs and the liver with the hemorrhage and the uh, injury to the organs themselves. And while the prosecution used Dr. Kelly's testimony to show Joseph Rosenbaum fell into Rittenhouse after being shot, the defense, on the other hand, argued Rosenbaum was pursuing Rittenhouse at the time of the shooting. You would agree that this shooting of Mr. Rosenbaum, which is captured partially on video, is a dynamic situation, correct? Correct. And if the furthest he was away with the stifling that you see in the wounds was four feet and closing, that goes very quickly, correct? If someone's running at you? Yes. Okay. And four feet, correct me if I'm wrong, is about from me to you away. That's about correct. And if I had my hands out, I'm even closer, correct? Yes. If I'm lunging and going for your gun, which is an extension away from your body, closer still. Yes. 
Okay, so Terry and Adam, let's break this down. Adam, I'm going to start with you. A big deal has been made about whether Rosenbaum fell forward or whether he was lunging forward. Do you think that it makes a difference here? I think it makes a difference. Um, you know, to, to get to the bar of intentional or reckless homicide, they really have to show, obviously, that he was acting in self-defense and that Rosenbaum was really, really trying to attack him and use uh, everything in his power to not only disarm uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, but to harm him. And, uh, you know, I got to say, from all the testimony that I've heard so far and seen, I think the prosecution is going to have a really tough time getting a homicide charge out of this. This sounds like someone who is mentally unstable, who may have had a chain. And whether it was lunging or falling, it, it, it matters semantically. But if Rittenhouse thought he was lunging and they can show that that was his, his mindset, then I think the defense has done all they need to do. Yeah, I agree. Terry, the coroner testified that the decedents suffered massive injuries. Why do you think Rittenhouse brought an AR-15 rifle to the scene? You know, that's an excellent question, Imran. Listen, he said he was there to provide medical assistance and to protect. If you're there to provide mm -hmm. medical assistance, you should be bringing medical equipment. Why not bring a defibrillator? He brings instead an AR-15. And if you are shot with an AR-15 rifle, you are likely to be killed. You heard the coroner there talking about the bullet wounds that these individuals sustained. And so there's no question that he went there with the intention, if he had any problems, to shoot to kill. So that's a problem. Yeah, Terry and Adam, great analysis. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily, where we will see you next time as we discuss justice in America.